This is, I think, number three. Um, John Warden uh, over there has been uh, handling the reins for the last uh, couple of a uh, couple of lectures. My name is Dennis Allison, and I'm the other half of the uh, the team that uh, tries to put this all together. Um, our speaker next week will be uh, Mark Lobach from uh, Rainmaker Technologies, and he's going to speak on um, how about wavelet modulation for highly efficient broadband communications, quote, end quote. And what he's done is he has a system which will deliver about uh, 10 gigabits a second on uh, standard cable. And um, he's going to talk about how it's accomplished and uh, what sort of products they're thinking about building. Um, our speaker. Did he write a book? Yes, he did. What was the book, John? Oh, I think he wrote a book with uh, Dave Farber on broadband communications, published by Prentice Hall. Um, so he, he knows a little bit about the field. Um, speaker today is uh, Dan Engels, uh, ex-Stanford, uh, some time ago. Um, no, well, you know, you were a kid at the time. And um, then uh, Xerox Park and Apple and a few other places, including Disney. Uh, he's been uh, the primary implementer, or at least a primary implementer, of something of like 20 small talk systems. Uh, he's going to talk about that today. And tomorrow uh, at the at Xerox Park, and I forget the time, 7 o'clock? 6.30, at Xerox Park up on Coyote Hill Road, uh, in a computer history museum talk, he's going to talk about the history of small talk and its implementations as well. But this is the technical side of things. So um, I'm just going to let you go on and inform us. You're on, John. So, uh That one seems to be an operative. We will give you this one instead. Explains why we had two to begin with. Yeah, we done. Yeah, right. <coughs> okay, how are we doing? This one ought to work. Okay. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what the focus usually is in these classes, but uh, I'll sort of allow you to interrupt me for a while and we'll see if we get kind of in sync. I figure from my background there probably are a number of people here or out there that are interested in Squeak and want to ask things about it. Um, and yet there are probably a bunch of people who don't know about Squeak. So it seems to me for the former group I'd like to talk some about where it came from in the early history, uh, but on the technical side and for the latter group uh, I'll try and go forward and show some of Squeak, and you can ask me about that. Um, so, where did it all start? Um, I was really lucky to sort of show up at Xerox Park at a time when uh, things were really getting going, and and got to sort of work on and participate in a number of small talk implementations, and uh, sort of looking back on the experience. It's got something to do with scientific method, and I put this slide up. Uh, in scientific method, you're supposed to you make an observation, and from that observation, you formulate a theory, and then you propose an experiment or design an experiment to validate the theory, and then you make the observation on the experiment. It goes around and around like that. And there's something similar that goes on with, uh, with <laughs> programming systems, which is you've maybe got some software applications, and uh, and if you look at them, you see that, oh, this was hard to do, this doesn't work right, so on and so forth. And especially at, at the level of language, it's, you know, this is, you know, described in an ugly manner or this isn't efficient. And so from that, uh, from that observation, you formulate not so much a theory as a new language that would describe it better, you know. And then using that, you rebuild the system, and then you get to rebuild the applications in that system. And if you've made progress, uh, everything works better, is smaller, you know, and all that stuff. So <clears throat> we got to do that several times. And I'm going to, uh, I think 
it's a useful process, so I'm going to talk some about you know where we went with it. Um, with with this group, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, the, what I want to do is just cover. We're going back to like 71, 72, and so in those days, uh, what what was there to sort of look at? Um, there were Lisp systems that you that uh, were definitely cool because they were just utterly simple and utterly general. And also, a really important thing about them, I think, is that they had automatic storage management. In other words, garbage collection. <laughs> so, uh, it's, I'll probably say numerous times during this talk, I think that, that uh, automatic storage management is the root of object-oriented programming. Uh, the memory has to behave like objects. You know, they have to hold together when you want them, and they have to go away when you don't want them. Uh, Lisp was not object-oriented at that time, but, but it had this wonderful storage property. Um, in terms of what we wanted for a simple system to work with, it was, in a way, sort of too general, too symbolic. Uh, I mean, it's, it's perfect for what it is, but the thing is that the, uh, it's nice to have some help with structure, some syntax, some uh, <clears throat> some some things built into the language that give you help that way. So that was, but that was definitely a key influence. Um, something that I really liked was APL, um, and I'm not exactly sure what it was about APL, but uh, and and here I've uh, now well and and I've made it readable here. I'm not using the Greek letters, um, but. Uh, <clears throat> It was another thing that just felt a little bit object-oriented, in, in the sense that you had uh, uh, the objects that you created and put in variables were, were arrays. And they knew how to arrays or numbers or vectors. And they all sort of knew how to do the right thing uh, with the operations. So it had that feeling. And it had some real help with the syntax. And that's why things are so terse. I mean, you can abuse that and make unreadable programs. And the Greek, the Greek letters contributed to that. Um, but, but it's nice to have something that you can just sit there and, and type expressions at like a calculator and, you know, with nothing extra and have it come right back. And it had a lot of power with it. Do you think the workbook models that uh, were agreed implemented like the MHDL have a lot to do with that field? Because it, it allowed you to, to, to actually collect the expressions and do functions and manipulate Well, it was good from the start, too, in, in that regard, at least. Um, the downside was that uh, it was really only arrays and numbers. I mean, you could define your own functions, but it wasn't extensible. And you sort of wanted to have all of that wonderful power to work with you know, uh, images, rectangles, points. Uh, I mean, you could make them all up out of arrays, um, but it, it just didn't seem natural to write a musical score using it. You know. Um, now, people built systems in it that did that, and that's fine. So APL was, was an influence just at the level of wanting something really simple and, and lively feeling. Um, <clears throat> at that time, I, I, was, uh, I was interested in or, or fascinated with APL, and I talked to Alan. So let's see, historically, what's, where we are in time is I got a job at Xerox Park working on a speech recognition system, and I got put across the hall from Alan Kay's office. And I spent all of my time listening to what was going on across the hall. And finally, I walked over there and you know, started talking to Alan about things that I liked a lot better than speech recognition. Anyway, um, he was he's incredibly widely read. And so as soon as I said I like APL, he said, oh, well, you should look into PPL, which is a system that Ben Wegbright did that was called polymorphic programming language. And it was extensible. Um, so I got interested in that. Um, and, and then it was at this point that, you know, I, Alan started, a whole lot of this was my education from Alan. Um, but he talked about the basic problem with extensible languages at that time, at least, which is that uh, if you don't have some other help, the more uh, structural help, the, the more parts the system gets in it, uh, the, the more complicated the system has. So for instance, if you've got not only things like, you're not going to be able to read all this, but uh, let me just see. For the people out there, let's just try this and see. I don't know if this will help, but um, if you've got, 
Yeah, it does sort of. So if you've got a plus function um, and it's and it's dealing with integers and floats, maybe just through normal coercions. But what about if it has to deal with dates and points and so on? Then pretty soon the code for that function starts to get full of test case, you know, tests. And uh, and the same thing with a print routine in spades because it's got to be able to print everything. Um, and then there's another there's another problem, uh, which is that. Uh, if you go and try to make a change to such a system, you find yourself editing the system print routine. And if you make one false move, you know, the system will crash. Uh, and you shouldn't have to be into that code that everybody else is depending when you add a new kind of thing. You just want to teach it how to print. So this is, uh, this is the so-called n squared problem of uh, extensible language. And I've just sort of illustrated it by uh, this little thing here. Okay, and it just gets worse and worse. I mean. Uh, this is, I think, about 25 nodes, but you can see there's 600 things you have to deal with in there. So, um, then there was Simula, and I, I knew nothing about Simula, but Alan at least had read about it. And they, uh, there were two things that went on in Simula. Um, it was kind of a scheduling simulation system bolted onto Algol. But in the process of doing that, they had realized that they needed to be able to talk about different kinds of objects. Um, and the, f the first kind of sim the first Simula, Simula 1, had no inheritance. The later Simula 67 did have inheritance. Um, and I've got some code here, which I'm just as happy for you not to be able to read. Um, but uh, they, they did the kind of stuff you needed to do to talk about new classes of objects and make instances of them. Uh, and that was a really powerful notion. I mean, before that time, the most that people had done was completely symbolic stuff in Lisp, where where you like, uh, you know, punzing together structures, um, or uh, records and references, which just isn't objects. Um, the downside is that they hadn't. Uh, it wasn't a lively language. It was bolted onto Algol. Um, you know, you couldn't. Uh, your things weren't first, you couldn't make up a new number class and have it be on a par with integers and so on. Um, and there was, uh, of course, no automatic storage management. Um, and the last sort of ingredient that came into this uh, is a system called Meta. Um, let me just sample this audience. How many people here know about Meta 2, say, or, or Meta? A couple of hands. Well, I want to highly recommend, this is the, uh, the coolest paper that ever was. Um, me, uh, well, here you can look at. It's called Meta 2. It's in the 1962. It was written in 1962 by Val Shorey. There's his name, D.V. Shorey. And you guys can all look it up. Incidentally, uh, I looked for a web, <coughs> web reference and uh, found none. So I'm going to see if I can get it at least put on the web. Um, but. Meta was, uh, there were a number of them made, and they got much more complicated than this. Uh, it's a, a sort of a program writing, a, 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 well, a syntax directed compiler, uh, compiler, compiler. And just to give you, I can give you just a quick sense of, uh, of this. this. This here is a little, um, a little Algol compiler, and uh, I'm, you're not going to be able to read this, but uh, so I will just walk you through it. Basically, there's a statement here that says, a program is a block followed by output halt. So, and then if you look at block, it says, block is begin followed by uh, any number of statements followed by end. And, and after each statement um, is something that it outputs. So it's sort of both, it combines this parsing of the input stream with uh, the generation of the output stream all in one simple statement, um, which is really nice. And uh, let me get rid of that guy. And uh, just the reason that I think that every computer science student should read this paper is right here is, <clears throat> which you also can't see, but that's the entire uh, meta compiling itself. So it, it reads through this program and outputs that same program. And what's cool about this, and this is how, why I got so excited, at that time the only thing I had easy access to or, or when I was into this was Fortran. And you can write one of these that outputs Fortran, and you run it through, and all of a sudden you've got 
a compiler for the language that you like written in Fortran, and you don't have to live with that anymore. So, so look, look that up and, uh, and read it. Incidentally, uh, I'm going to be putting together a page. Uh, it'll be on this place called squeakland.org. Uh, with the references from this talk, and, and as time goes on, some of the real content of it. So, uh, um, but this one you can get out of the computer science library. At least you you used to be able to. And it was uh, you looked through the uh, it was CACM, I think. Um, you looked through that particular volume, and there's there's this one swatch of ten pages that's just dog-eared and it's black all around. So anyway, those were the ingredients that went into the invention of Smalltalk 72. And uh, Alan tells the story that uh, Ted Taylor was with me there at that time, and uh, and a couple of other folks. And we would have these talks, and, and Ted and I were wondering, because I was interested in doing some sort of neater APL, um, how big a system you'd have to write uh, to make you know a really powerful language. And uh, Alan said, well, less than a page. And we said, yeah, show us. And so he sort of went away for about a week. Um, he would come in every once in a while and, and, and try something on us. And, uh, and what he came, uh, what he came, well, let's see. This is the language that he came up with. And I'm just going to run through it so you get a sense of what the language is. And then we can talk about how you do it. Um, it's very simple. You, uh, <coughs> you define. Uh, it uses the, this. We had logo was another thing that Alan was playing with at the time, and uh, and in logo you define things by saying you know like to run you know and then you define the definition of run. So to was the defining word in uh, in Smalltalk 72, and the way the code looks like is uh, first you test if if you're making up a new one, and if so what what this says is quote head gets the next input. And this says, quote, tail gets the next input. And the definition is, uh, this is defining a list pair. So it says, uh, let me grab my magnifying glass here. Um, uh, whoops, I grabbed it by the wrong part. Sorry about that. This will be much easier if I do this. <clears throat> OK, so it's defining a pair, and it has a head and a tail. And then if it's new, then quote head gets the next input. And so th this is the quote symbol. It means this next thing in the token stream. And set the tail to be the next input. So that's how you create a new one. And then once you've made one, uh, you can ask it for its head. This, that's an eyeball. It says, if you see head, and that's, that's an implies arrow, then. <laughs> if you see a left arrow, then bind hit to the next thing. So that, that would be if you said some pairs head gets five, then it would rebind it. Um, if you don't see the left arrow, then return hit. So, so you define both the read and write accessors for head. Same thing for tail. And then print is um, print out an open paren, uh, print the head, and then come down here, print a dot, print the tail. And this is, see, it's sending the message print to tail. So the way this syntax works is um, each new object looks at the next thing and treats it as a message in the message stream. And then put out, uh, put out a closed parenthesis. And then you could write things like, well, so we can go on to examples, but we'll do that a little bit later. <coughs> um, so what this had was from Lisp, it had a simple eval. Alan wrote it on about a half a page of paper, um, and it had and it assumed automatic storage management. It it could do infix notation uh, as helpful syntax. It was really easy to write programs in. It had classes and instances from Simula, um, and it had this sort of metas model of gobbling up the message stream. And uh, so. I said that he wrote it in about a half a page. That was sort of done just as expressions. And, and we have yet to locate that piece of paper, by the way. But if you unrolled it into sort of an iterative interpreter, it took about a page and a half. 
And this is, this is what I wrote down. So after Alan finally came in with something that he said would work, then I went away for a couple of weeks uh, trying, to, trying to see how it would work. And the, the system I had to work with, at the, the only interactive system I had access to at the time was BASIC. So I, I coded the thing up in BASIC. Um, I'm, I'm not ashamed. I got it going quickly. Um, and, uh, Was that before BCPL? In the lab? Well, BCPL certainly wasn't interactive. Um, but, no, and also, see, we were in kind of a different, different part of the lab from those who used BCPL. Um, but, uh, anyway. Uh, so let's take a look at, at what the structures looked like. Since, uh, so this is the first, <coughs> The first VM I did was that one in BASIC, and then uh, we, and you know, so what's the what's the lesson from that? I guess the lesson is if you, if you want to find out if something works, use the whatever lets you write it quickest, you know, and that happened to be so for me then. Now it would be squeak. Um, so memory in this system was laid out uh, with uh, with the atoms or print str uh, thing uh, unique strings at the bottom of memory. And then there was a tiny little place where the current state of the machine was stored. And then there was a general storage allocation space. And uh, this was, it was an amazing experience for me because sort of Alan had this thing that needed to run and I had nothing to start with. So I sort of, uh, it was like on the job training for, uh, for computer science. You know, I'd taken Canoe's course on data structures and, and all of that, and all of a sudden I had to put it all to use. So, uh, so I had to make a storage manager, and the first one that we used, and we used this for a long time, used uh, reference counts. So you would count how many things were pointing at the objects and, and keep track of that, and when it, the count went to zero, then you'd free it. Um, the, the reason we stuck with it for as long as we did was in the in these days, the machines were really slow, and we wanted good interactive performance. And we certainly hadn't encountered any garbage collectors that on that machine didn't make an objectionable uh, pause. Uh, so, so it actually served us pretty well. Um, you would get garbage when the reference, <coughs> uh, let's see, to save space, we only used three bits for the reference counts. So they would get stuck at seven. Um, and then. So we would lose some objects that way. And so the next thing we did was add to that an overflow table for reference counts. So that meant that you could reclaim those. And then all that we were left with was circular structures, which fortunately people didn't make very often. Or if they did, they quickly learned to break them. Um, anyway, so this was a generally managed area of storage. And then coming down from the top were the, what we called activation records, a stack um, of of call, of call frames, basically. And the, the code that, that I showed you was stored incredibly simply, just as tokens in an array. So here's an example of 3 plus 4. And it's, uh, it's a vector of length 4 and then three pointers. And a nil at the end, I, don't, uh, I, I guess at this period, I was just in the process of <laughs> changing over from terminating things with nil to putting the size on them. Anyway, this first one points to an instance of class number, so it has a point to the number class as its first field and then a three. Uh, the second one is an atom which, which had its own special representation. It's basically a character string. Um, oh yeah, it points to a character string uh, of length one and its character is a plus. And then, uh, and then the, the number four. So that's how that's how code was stored. That's how, uh, how memory was managed. Uh, and then at runtime, the way it worked was there were these little uh, these are little activation records, and they kept track of obviously the return. Well, there was self, which was the the instance that was currently running. There was return, which is the activation they called you. Um, and then there was message, which is a pointer to the message stream which wasn't always the same as where your code was. For instance, if you were fetching an argument, it was, it started to evaluate a piece of the, of the code up above you. And then global was, uh, was the context in which to look up the variables. Uh, so that's how that worked. And um, just for fun, a little while ago, 
I wrote uh, an interpreter for the old Smalltalk 72 in Squeak, so uh, thus succeeded to sort of bring it back to life. This is how the screen looked in those days. It's funny, it looks clipped to me like you can't see the left. Oh, you, well, you can up here. Can people out in the outside world see the left of that rectangle? It would, okay, good. Um, we'll assume that. So you could type three, three plus four and, uh, and hit the do it key and you get seven. And uh, another, we, we put floating, num floating points in there pretty soon and uh, you could also do that. Um, and then what else could you do? You could do turtle geometry. So there was, there was a class turtle, I got a, excuse me, this, there's extra context. So we were, uh, we were working together with Seymour Papert's group at MIT who did the, the logo project, basically. Um, and they had had a lot, of, a lot of luck with kids sort of teaching them basic scientific thought uh, with computers around uh, what they call turtle geometry, which is the notion of an object that has direction and can draw lines. So, and, and the, the one in, uh, in Smalltalk 72 was, you could type it with the at sign, it's called smiley. So, you could do things like uh, smiley home, uh, and erase the screen, and then 4i to 300, uh, smiley go I uh, turn 89, say. And you'd get that kind of a pattern. It didn't run that fast, even though it, <laughs> even though it was coded in machine, in machine code. But, uh, and then, uh, let's see, I, uh, well, so I'm not going to take a lot of time. There's also, you know, you can define pair the way that I showed you, and it all works. And actually, in this system, a number of, uh, a number of interesting applications were written. Uh, and, and we used it. We used it for, see, how long it held? Like four years, practically. Um, we had... Uh, Uh, that, uh, I'll just say a bit about what we learned. Um, automatic storage and, and dynamic types are key to object-oriented programming. Um, another thing that we learned was the convenience of uh, what we call snapshots, um, saving the entire state of your system exactly the way it was at the end of your last keystroke. Um, and this was especially motivated on the Alto computers because they had removable disk packs. And if you did that um, and saved your state on the disk pack, you could go away and go to a completely other alto on a completely other day and resume exactly where you were before. Um, and that, that really stood the test of time with us. That's convenient. Um, we learned that simplicity and generality are more important than speed. Um, you have to make yourself feel good about this when you have a slow system. So, uh, <laughs> but, but the truth is that you know our group at Xerox Park was a group of just see, typically about six people. Um, uh, Adele and Alan had the only PhDs in the group, and truly we we kept uh, we kept up a pretty good race, at least in terms of neat concepts, with the whole computer science lab. Um, and and a lot of it had to do with just being able to do stuff really quickly. I mean, the time to try something out was no more than the time to type it. I mean, we never waited for for compilation. Um, and, uh, and another thing that, that we learned was that uh, it's, again, especially if the system's a little bit on the slow side, um, but uh, it's really the, the kinds of primitives you have available makes a big difference. So you can have a, a sort of leisurely system, but if it has good text operations, good um, bit aligned graphics uh, and line drawing, uh, you can do really neat stuff. Um, and, and a bunch of things, Diana Mary spent a long time uh, sort of doing all the things that Alan suggested that led up to BitLit. Uh, so the ability to 
poppy rectangles uh, around on the screen and put up uh, <clears throat> paragraphs of stylized text. Uh, she did all that stuff sort of the hard way before we figured out how to do it simpler. Um, so even though uh, we could make ourselves happy with how nice the system was, you always want to go faster, you always want more, and you always want things to be better. Um, so we had a, a, a sort of another run at this in 1974 called Smalltalk 74, appropriately. Um, and there we made an object for the incoming message stream, which sort of made a little bit more of a meta system. And we made a dictionary for the, the little methods that had been done with the eyeball peaking. Um, but uh, the truth is, neither of those really sped things up a great deal, because the, it, it was still parsing everything as it ran. Um, also, there were problems with the system in that uh, the syntax was ambiguous. You know, you could write, you could write two successful Smalltalk 72 programs, and when you put them both into the system, they did not work together. Um, and, uh, and, and lastly, uh, well, it, it was still too slow. And context, the, the sort of stack frames, were not real objects, and classes were not real objects. And I think that was a real sort of shortfall. Um, it takes you a while to see these things in hindsight. But uh, anyway, that was sort of the, uh, oh, so let me talk about <clears throat> the couple of things that we did do in Smalltalk 72 and 4 uh, that were re really useful later, well, at least for a while. Um, one was a virtual memory called Ooze, and that was something that Ted Taylor and I worked on. Uh, I think I never would have done it if, if I hadn't been working with Ted. Ted is fearless about arbitrary levels of structure. And <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, the Alto was a 16-bit machine, and the ones we had uh, had 64 K words of storage, so it wasn't a lot of space. Um, and it had about a two megabyte disk pack. <clears throat> so Ooze was a scheme, it's called, uh, it stood for Object Oriented Zoned Environment. And, uh, <clears throat> let me drink some water here. Mm. I'm not sure, yeah, I guess you can probably see that. Um, but I'm mainly going to talk about it and, and talk quickly. Um, the, the essence of the scheme was that with, with a 16-bit address space, <coughs> we would address 64,000 objects, not 64,000 you know, bytes or words. Um, so there was an object table, and a pointer was a pointer into that object table. And the table allowed you an indirection at which point you could go off and get something off the disk. And it was called a zoned environment because it was, uh, we split the address space up into 512 zones. And within a zone, it was utterly uniform. So they were all instances of the same class. Uh, and that allowed things to be compact on the disk. And it also had some really nice properties for saving the state of the system uh, for robustness. And I think I'm not going to go into that much more at this point. Um, uh, I think I'm just going to zoom forward a little bit, and then I'll stop in about probably 10 minutes. Um, and you can see how we're doing. Uh, this is a slide on Bitblit, and it's missing the picture that I didn't have a chance to put in there. But um, Bitblit was another thing that we that got developed out of the Smalltalk 72 experience, and it, it was done during Smalltalk 74. And uh, it's. It's notable in, in terms of system building in a couple of ways, I think. I'm, I, I don't mean it's great. What I mean is uh, one thing that was neat about the whole Alto experience and with the, the other machines at Xerox Park also, it's, it's wonderful to be working on a machine where there's a small amount of a dynamite resource. So the Alto had a small amount of microcode memory available, and it ran five times faster than anything else. So it really motivated you to pick little important pieces of code and simplify them and purify them and then get the whole system built on top of that. And uh, Biplet was such a thing. So we had had experience with a Smalltalk system working with text, working with rectangles on the screen, and working with uh, line drawing routines on the screen. And <clears throat> I mean, after about two years, it began to hit us that, you know, we've got 
30 pages that's all doing masking and shifting. <laughs> and there must be a better way. And so out of that experience came, you know, let's do something general that does bit aligned rectangle operations on the screen. And, and that sort of combined with uh, this precious microcode resource to say, let's define a really small kernel. And so that's, that's the experience out of which BitBlit came. And we got it running in Smalltalk 74, and then it went on to serve all the other Smalltalks and sort of, you know, it got big. Um, everybody uses it. Um, so then in 1976, uh, a bunch of things sort of all happened at once, and uh, I can't explain how it happened, but I, I think it happened because, you know, it's one of these things that if you sit with something for long enough, you'll figure out something about it. Um, we had been sitting with classes and, and, and stack frames or contexts not being, a, you know, usable as objects. Um, and we had also uh, really, really come to where we wanted inheritance. Uh, I mean, to the point that we would take uh, uh, one of these arrays of code and point to it from three separate places just so we could share it, you know, which is terrible. But uh, so in Smalltalk, so Smalltalk 76 made classes and contexts be first class objects. It added a simple uh, hierarchy of classes that gave inheritance. Um, <clears throat> and it came up with a keyword syntax that was sort of like English. It had a lot of the same feel of Smalltalk 72, except that it had colons on it. <laughs> um, but, but the notable thing was that it was compilable. So the syntax was fixed, um, which it wasn't in Smalltalk 72. Therefore, it could be compiled by a compiler and readable by a human, which certain programs in Smalltalk 72 also were not. You just couldn't tell until you ran the object. Um, and it, uh, it, together with that, um, I came up with a compact and efficient bytecode instruction set so that it was compiled into these bytecodes. And uh, and this also, I think, was inspired by having microcode around. You know, you knew that if you could make a fairly small engine, um, you know, you could make that part of the system go really fast. Um, and we still had Fitlet and Ooze left over from uh, Smalltalk 74. So those things all together made up Smalltalk 76, which I think was sort of the first real uh, what would you call uh, sort of viable, serious object-oriented programming system? So let me. Uh, well, you can't read that anyway. This will be in the references. It's a paper by me called Smalltalk 76. Um, oh, and in fact, it's uh, it's on the web. Um, and if you go to squeak.org, and maybe in Squeakland, but if you go to squeak.org, there's a place where you'll get to. Uh, to this paper reference. Um, and just sort of for perspective, uh, the systems that were built, the, the kernel system of Smalltalk 72 was about 20 classes and about 200 what you would call methods. I mean, they weren't broken up because they were all these sort of vectors. And it took up about, I think, 20K. Um, the Smalltalk 76 system had 35 classes, 500 methods, and about 25k of code. And I never measured that back then, but I, uh, <clears throat> I recently made it so that Squeak could read in the whole bootstrap of Smalltalk 76, and that's the figure. That's the figure I got. Um, let's see. This is how it worked. <laughs> Um, this is a, fi a, a figure that's in the paper, and it's essentially how all of uh, the modern small talks work. It's the same as how Smalltalk 80 works. Um, and uh, so I think those of you who want to know about that can, uh, can go read about it. I'm trying to think of what's notable to point out here. I think what I'm going to do is to stop about the level of detail and just entertain a couple of questions and then I can go on from here. Any, how are we doing so far? Yeah. I've heard Alan Case say that 
from the point of view of kids, that small size 76 was a mistake. It was really a step forward for professional developers who yeah. left the kids behind. So we were yeah. Here, here. Was, you complained about dating. Well, you both have heard. No, no, but no, he. This man is you right. Know, uh, Alan did have. No. Alan did have that that complaint about Smalltalk 76, and uh, it was a. Uh, I think it, we kind of crossed the watershed in that point where he realized <laughs> he realized that I wanted to make serious software, <laughs> and um, it, it it really is true that Smalltalk 76 is more complicated um, and is not, what I've come to understand it as is, is not a scripting language. And you can really, as far at the level of this discussion, you can consider Smalltalk 76 to be the sm same as Smalltalk 80. What, what Smalltalk 80 did, and there are a couple of slides that, that show this, uh, Smalltalk 80 really cleaned up a couple of things. Uh, it added Booleans, it added characters, and it gave uh, blocks with arguments. Um, uh, and it added meta classes, which uh, that that's the one that Alan uh, <laughs> slightly holds against Smalltalk 80. Um, but <laughs> but it's absolutely true that he was bothered by this, and I think there's a good reason for it. I think that Smalltalk 72 is a better scripting language than Smalltalk 80, um, and uh, and <clears throat> and you know it's funny there were. Uh, when I did Smalltalk 76, I remember saying, <clears throat> when he made that complaint, there's no problem. You can write Smalltalk 72 in Smalltalk 76, and it'll go just as fast as it used to. The only thing was, I didn't do it, you know, and I should have. Um, and, and, you know, now, I mean, that's part of the fascination with doing that, that little one that I showed you. Um, and, and it's possible to do that even cleaner and simpler, and I'm hoping you know, Helen and I can write a paper about that sometime. But uh, that's something that we should have done. And uh, and yeah, I think Smalltalk 72 is a better scripting language, and it's easier for kids to understand. I think that <coughs> the Smalltalk model, which is in Smalltalk 80 and Squeak and 76, can be made as easy for kids to use. And if you look in Squeak, you'll find a sort of a tile programming system that's laid on top of it, um, which is, I think, pretty much as easy as Smallpox 72. Um, OK, well, let's see. If we're doing OK, let me just uh, zip on a little bit farther, um, at least get through this stuff. Because um, I did want to talk about various forces on the design of virtual machines. So Smallpox 78 <coughs> was inspired by uh, a project called the Note Taker at Xerox. Um, and this was a hardware project that Doug Fairbairn uh, was the chief hardware person on, which was to build a, uh, a portable computer around the then uh, forthcoming microprocessors, the Intel 8086 and the Motorola 68000, which were the first 16-bit machines that just seemed to have enough power to do the kinds of stuff we were doing at Xerox Park. It was a very nice little machine. It had a, uh, a beautiful bitmap display with a touch screen on it and, uh, and an 8086 in it. So uh, we did a, a version of Smalltalk 76 for that. And it was interesting what that forced us to do. Uh, <coughs> we, had, we had this ooze virtual memory that we used uh, in Smalltalk 76, which took advantage of the Altos microcode. And uh, you know, if you have to go through an, uh, if you have to actually hash into an object table every time you touch an object, it'll never work unless you have microcode. Well, the Intel 8086 did not have microcode. Believe me, we tried to figure out how we could get at the microcode, um, but we couldn't. So that meant things had to be simplified. So we went to a straight indexed object table, got rid of the, virtu the virtual uh, memory, and then. Also, in our systems up until that time, we, we still had lots of assembly code devoted to the display of text and, uh, and graphics and lines. And so this was the time that we said, OK, we're going to get rid of that and only use BitBlit. So we did that. Um, and by, by doing those two things, we, we cut the interpreter size down from 32K, which is what it had been before, to 6K of uh, 8086 assembler. 
So that really, uh, that sort of showed us that, you know, something, this was a neat little package. Um, and it actually, on the 8086, we, it ran about twice as fast as Smallpox 76 did on the Alto. Um, now, the, the screen experience wasn't actually quite as fast uh, because the, um, I'm giving you the speed of the interpreter of Smallpox. Um, Bitlet ran a little bit slower, so it actually seemed about the same. And then we got, uh, we did one experiment that was fun, which was we, we had a separate board that was an Ethernet processor. Um, and we put Bitlet in that board and put a queue between the two. And then, you know, that gave us about another factor of two in speed. Um, so <coughs> this, this led, Six or eight? What was it? Or, I'm terrible on this kind of history, but yeah. And and I think you know there were occasionally two that ran, um, usually just one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it was clearly a good concept. I mean, the Osborne computer came out not long after that. They sold a bunch, and you know it just kept going on from there. <clears throat> um, but out of that experience. Uh, you know, well, let's see, several things were going on. It's, the note taker project failed, and this, uh, this was depressing to us, <laughs> because, you know, we, we had sort of been thinking, oh boy, a real computer that we can sell, and everybody's going to have small talk, and it'll be wonderful, and it just, you know, that wasn't going to happen. So that, that created, what's that? Why did you say that? Uh, it, uh, uh, it was a combination of, you know, what it was, what the market was, and what Xerox was. Um, and and I couldn't even give you the real answer. Adele probably could. <laughs> um, but anyway, it probably was appropriate for it to fail. Anyway, it's good that it failed because we got depressed about small talk not getting out. and and. Adele got serious about doing the small talk that we would put out as a system in the outside world. Um, so we took all of the best things from small talk 78 and, uh, <clears throat> and cleaned up a bunch of things and Adele documented it all. It's <laughs> we have never had a documenter in our group except for Adele and, uh, and that made a huge difference. And then, you know, the, having it released commercially so that companies got involved uh, really made a difference. And let's see, I should read my notes here so I don't miss something. I told you about uh, most of the cleanups. Also, an important thing about that release was a system called MVC uh, that Adele and Trigvi and Jim Alcoff had all worked on. Um, and what it did, it, <coughs> it was a reflection on all the various schemes we had tried for for uh, window systems and that combined with the importance of making things multiply viewable and just a nice refactoring of all of that and uh, and then a, a whole a family of pained browsers that really were inspired by the first one that Larry Tesla did um, and that together made uh, the gestalt of Smalltalk 80 and I think I was going to take you for a tour through Small Talk 80, but I think everybody sort of knows what's that like, what that's like. So let me, uh, I did a bad thing. I didn't bring a clock, and I'd like to stop. How much time we got? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so let me stop at this point and just ask about, let me see what's beyond here about Small Talk 80, blah, blah, blah. So some of the other things that were good about the release was that it got companies involved in, and things went outside of our group. So, so there were people who did much better storage management systems, uh, real garbage collection for small talk, and and Dave uh, did. I, you did. The, did you do the first incremental one? I'm, I'm not sure. Generation. Yeah. Generation. Yep. Um, and. Uh, and faster interpreters. I mean, we worked a lot on fast interpreters, and that could be a whole fun discussion here. But um, and then also, uh, Peter and you worked on uh, uh, dynamic translation, taking where you translate bytecodes into 
<coughs> machine code and, and all the wonderful tricks you can play about having that second rec, uh, representation. And then a bunch of major applications written and standards and just general acceptance in the marketplace. So uh, it was important that that went out. I mean, it really sort of put, put, put it in the world. Yeah, so the next thing I uh, would talk about is Squeak. So let me just stop here about sort of any questions about that history, and in particular, since I said I'd be talking about um, virtual machines and designs and, and those trade-offs. Anything about that? Yeah. Well, you can have a lot of fun with bytecode interpreters. Um, and the basic idea in any bytecode interpreter is uh, you pick up an instruction and you know you see what it has to do, and you go on and and do the next one and keep doing that. Um, <clears throat> what are some of the tricks? Uh, well, the, the first tricks you play have to do with what's the fastest way that you can get the next instruction, and uh, and that involves all sorts of trade-offs. Uh, we did one, one of the quick ones that we did on the Alto. See, the Alto also. Uh, being microcoded, well, I suppose some cache architectures have this property a little bit, um, but you could do a bunch of instructions uh, between every memory reference. Um, so one of the things you could do is you could pick up, you know, four byte codes and leave them around in a register, and then to pick up a byte code, you don't necessarily have to run memory for the next one. Um, so that's one of the things you can do. Um, also, uh, the design of the byte code set is important. Um, there, uh, one of the really fun things to do with uh, an interpreter like that is you can you can encode information about the state of the machine in the interpreter itself. So here's an example. Um, supposing uh, some of the instructions, supposing you got instructions like uh, uh, do a compare and put true or false on the stack. And then you've got other instructions like branch if false and pop. Okay, so if you're running this along, you realize that a fair amount of your time, if you've got really tight code, is spent putting true or false on the stack and then taking it off and testing it. So what you can do is you can have three copies of <laughs> three copies of the interpreter, um, a normal one, and one that is a special copy of the interpreter that means I have true on the top of the stack. It doesn't, but that's what being in that copy of the interpreter means. And then you've got another copy of the interpreter means that means I have false on the top of the stack. And and <clears throat> those three interpreters all work the same, except that in the one that has false that means I have false on the top of the stack. If you look at the code for branch if false and pop, all it does is pop, and uh, and similarly. So you can do that kind of thing. Um, basically throwing space at speed. Um, and and uh, often it doesn't take a lot of extra space because you can have a dispatch uh, a dispatch table and uh, and they share almost all the routines except for the ones that depend on this particular difference. So that's a kind of thing. Um, and then there are other things you can do like copying the next dispatch, which is to say picking up uh, an instruction and, and branching somewhere. You can put an extra copy of that at the end of every routine so that you do less looping. Things like that. Uh, it, it, the, the most fun one that I ever sort of discovered and wanted to do and never did, so this is something somebody could work on, is uh, um, I wanted to have a separate copy of the interpreter that meant um, I called another context, but I haven't set up the other context yet. So this is like lazy, lazy activation of a context. And if you go through and you run a simulation of Smalltalk code, you'll find there are quite a few methods that, that actually return before they ever needed an, a whole new context. Um, so for, in, for instance, if, the, if you take, if you compare, uh, if the thing starts off, you know, if it's a uh, foo argument, so if it, if it begins with um, argument test for nil, if so, return self, that 
that never needs to have a whole other context set up. So, so this other copy of the interpreter can just run that stuff, and and then when it returns, it goes back to the normal copy of the interpreter. Um, and you've never you've never wasted that time. So, that's that's on those kind of tricks. Okay, so let me uh, let me say a few words about Squeak. So. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, after, I went away from the field for about a decade, and then when I came back, um, I looked around for, I went dead, didn't I? Um, went to sleep. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, came back to the industry and looked around for something to do, and eventually wound up back in Alan Kay's group at Apple. And, um, we wanted uh, a software system that we had complete control over, and I said, "Oh, that's easy, small talk." Um, except that, you know, we didn't have a real small talk to use. Uh, small talk was pretty much dead at Apple, and uh, <clears throat> and I had just had this experience at Interval of building a small talk essentially out of out of the old Apple small talk, um, and and realized that it was really pretty easy to do, but you have to write all this ugly C code. Um, so uh, right about the time that I was, uh, that I was, you know, getting ready to, to go to Apple, um, I had this notion that, gee, machines are so fast, you could run it all in Smalltalk itself um, and at least get it running. And then we had had an experience back at, uh, at Xerox where Kid Kaler wrote a whole object uh, a whole virtual memory called Loom, and uh, he wrote it all in uh, in Smalltalk, and then we had to make it practical, and we converted it to uh, BCPL. So we just all we did was we took the code and decompiled it, and we edited the decompiler so that it printed BCPL instead of Smalltalk. Um, and so I had that experience in the back of my mind, and realized, oh gee, any system code that you've written kind of carefully in Smalltalk. In other words, you haven't used real message sins. It's all just moving integers around. That kind of thing you can translate to C. I mean, you can translate it to native code. Um, so that was the germ of the idea behind Squeak. Um, and so we, uh, <clears throat> so we, we basically spent about two months and got a Smalltalk going. Um, from scratch that way. We were lucky, you know, being at Apple, we had the old Apple small talk. And let's see. Um, let's, uh, I'll just give you a quick notion. So, uh, so the idea was we wanted to be able to uh, run on any old machine. Um, and we had, uh, we had the Apple small talk existing. So on, on a Mac, um, we could run the old, uh, Apple interpreter. See, it was all it was all written in machine code too in order to go fast. Um, so we could use that at least. Um, so what we did was we took we got out of the the blue book. It, it, it's so wonderful that there's an entire copy of the Smalltalk interpreter in the blue book. Um, and and the funny thing is, uh, you know, we talked at that time we talked about. Um, Debugging the documentation. See, uh, Dave wrote the part of the documentation. Dave Robson wrote the documentation for uh, the the virtual machine part of Smalltalk 80. And but we wanted to make it real, so he made it real. And, and I actually worked on him some in that. So at that time, we talked about debugging the documentation. And the funny thing is, the Squeak project turned it around, and we ran the documentation. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, so we got this whole copy of the interpreter, which uh, Mario, its son, had had actually keyed in. We got a copy of that, um, and I think, yeah. So so we got that much running um, as a simulation, and and then uh, and then John Maloney, who was on the project, wrote a translator from Smalltalk to C, um, and we put that in there. So we got the whole thing actually running. So what was neat was in. It, uh, I think less than two months, we were actually working on the new system, although it was really slow because it was running actually in Smalltalk. 
Um, and, and in parallel with that, John was developing the translator. So, you know, only a couple of weeks after we were actually starting to get stuff done, he had a translator going. And so, and that produced C, which you could put on any processor, um, which was neat because we realized that this was going to really open stuff up. Uh, it would be an interpreter that you could run on any machine in C. It might not be the world's fastest, but it would certainly be practical at the speed machines were going. Um, so this then you could move over to any other machine um, and then you've got the whole system there uh, on the other machine. So that's that's the essence of squeak. Um, and uh, let's make this. And what that added to it, uh, in addition to making something totally portable this way, uh, we we then started to work seriously on it. So we added color to all that we had had was a black and white bitlet. So we add color to that, and then arbitrary uh, scaling and rotation and sort of anti-aliasing as well. And then a system called Morphic, which was a, a newer kind of sort of more object-oriented uh, approach to user interface. Um, and uh, and then music, which has always been fond, uh, fond to our hearts, dear to our hearts. And uh, another neat thing about this way that we brought up, that we produced the virtual machine was that you could turn that same mechanism loose on any of the primitives you had. So the bit flip that runs in Squeak is all written in Smalltalk. Um, and and also the music synthesis is all written in Smalltalk. And it, it just goes through this level of uh, translation. Um, so you have, you have to be a little bit careful about if there are restrictions on the code you can write that way. but. Believe me, if you're writing music synthesis, you, you know, you're thinking that way anyway. Um, and then sockets, that was a big thing. And that uh, enabled, we've, Squeak has a, uh, a network browser, an email uh, system. And uh, something else that re has really helped us sort of as a community, this system of updates. So there's a server somewhere that has an index on it and a whole bunch of files. and your squeak will automatically go out and look on that server and see if there are new updates, and if so, load them into your system. So it's allowed uh, the whole squeak community, at least those who want to, to move forward as fast as we make changes, essentially. Uh, and it lets us put out you know, bug fixes and things like that really quickly. Um, there's a whole eToy system. And uh, what an eToy is, is uh, this, uh, it's a, a simplified programming environment that, in which you have sort of visual viewers and, uh, and this, this tile programming scheme that I talked to you about. Uh, there's also 3D support. And then uh, Ian Pumarda in France has also done some really neat work. Uh, he and, and a couple of others have helped him on uh, dynamic translation in Squeak. Uh, now his his latest and fastest one. Now I don't know if it's the very latest. He hasn't been talking to me for a couple of months, so I think he's got something even better. Um, but the the most recent one was was done pretty much in C++, and I've wanted to get him to turn that around. That too could all be written in Squeak, and it would have to go through a first phase where where it runs in Squeak and and puts out the beginnings of the translator before it can actually run. But I think that would be fun. Definitely circular. So let us uh, let me pop out here and just sort of take you through some of the parts of Squeak. Is that, is that a reasonable next direction to go? Um, I don't know if people want to talk about uh, I, There isn't a lot more to say about the current Squeak virtual machine in terms of it as another generation. The first one we did was very simple, right after the book, right following the book. And then uh, sort of the biggest thing that we had to do to make that go faster was to make pointer variables for a bunch of things. So we did that. And then, then we just sort of hammered on it increasingly to the point that we can't make it go any faster. And that's why this uh, jitter, as it's called, the dynamic translator, is is important at this point. But it's a it's a pretty viable system. Um, on my Mac, it runs at uh, 30 million bytecodes a second, which 
boy, I can remember at Xerox when uh, when they got the fastest sort of machine in the world for us to use, and we got one million byte codes per second. So, um, and that's just an interpreter. That's not Ian's runs. Uh, <coughs> it runs the benchmarks at like five times. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just wondering if there was any influence uh, with other attempts like Kyoto Common List. I think it's pretty similar to the earlier one to do something like this in Lisp, where the Lisp was implemented by translating to C and was mm -hmm. therefore very portable. There was a prologue or something. So, was this sort of done with any influence from other attempts to make languages in this way? No. No, it just. It just occurred to us, and uh, I mean, I think it's a natural thing to occur to anybody who uh, who has one tool that they love and want to do everything in it. Um, I mean, you know, I, part of my motivation was just that there, there is there's something bad about doing everything, trying to do everything the same, which is, you know, small talk is not the best model for everything in the world. Um, it's not the best way to do logic programming, but. But there is something really nice about a single language system, which is that uh, if somebody learns about it, they can learn everything about it. And, and that's what's fun, I think, about Squeak, which is you know, s somebody who gets this, if they happen to be that inquisitive kind of person who wants to take everything apart, I mean, they can go down and change the virtual machine and make a new one. And, and so, so that's neat. And my guess is that I haven't known about these, and I'd be interested to to follow up on it. My guess is there's that same kind of thing going on in those those projects. I'll have to talk to you later about that. Um, so let me just take a quick tour through some of the things in Squeak and then uh, about, how, about how much time? Yeah. 10 minutes. Okay. So uh, first I'll show you a little bit about some of the, let me just divide 10 minutes up here appropriately. So this is the, the paper called Back to the Future, which is about, um, it's, it's what we wrote about uh, doing Squeak. And let's see, I should say also who we is at this point. It's Scott Wallace, uh, Ted Taylor, John Maloney, me, and Andreas Robb, and we're sort of the quantum mechanics. And then uh, Kim Rose and Alan Kay and uh, Pat Brecker. That's most of the central crew. And then there are hundreds of people, although you know less than that, who are really active on the Squeak uh, mailing list, and it's just really fun. You know, they contribute a lot, too. Um, so this is all, uh, let's see, this is all active text, and you can just, uh, you know, you can type in it like that the way you'd expect to type enough to make the line wrap. There we go. Um, and you can, uh, you can pick something up and drop it down on the text like that anywhere you want. And you can take this and uh, <clears throat> so there's, there's a pretty nice, uh, oh, what am I doing here? <laughs> you can take this then and uh, let's see. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to think and play at the same time. It's not working. There we go. Yeah, you can do that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so something that uh, a way in which I think of this as being different from a lot of other software you know a lot of software is built to do something and it comes to do that and you can't play around with it and the, the text in Squeak you can definitely play around with this is something I had wanted to do for ages um, so when we finally did a, a, a rework of the basic paragraph model in addition to doing that, you know, wrapping around other objects, you know, it, it, it also will wrap around the inside uh, of any shape like that. And I don't know if you can tell it, but this this thing here is a little pipe, and and it's connecting this text. You see, another morph. Then you ask to have it go around like that, and so and then it fills the bottom one. So now you can watch that again, and you'll see that that's what's happening. And this guy down here, uh, let me see if I can do it right. Not doing it, right? Are you afraid they might have this? 
I don't know. This is uh, this is viscosity taken to the uh, the next degree. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's a little bit about text. Um, it, you know, it's 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 fun to play with this stuff, but I also feel it like I have to make a disclaimer, which is that uh, that's all there, but it's not easy. It's not easy the way it should be to do you know a word processing document and squeak. So somebody. Somebody needs to come along and build the framework that I did sort of by hand to do that uh, that version of Back to the Future in the system. Um, so the basic paragraphs all do that, but uh, <clears throat> but we still need to uh, to put together a proper word processing system like Word. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> we played around with sound uh, quite a bit. Uh, I talked about sound output. We um, I'm trying to think of exactly how to say this. It's really nice if you release a system if it comes with real sound output and real sound input from the beginning because it's something that it's not easy for people to do. So we, we really, we, we failed to do that when we put out Smalltalk 80 and we really wanted to do that when we put out Squeak. And we did. Um, so this is about sound input and uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll show you something here. Let's see. So this is uh, this is a window that's doing uh, fast Fourier transforms and showing them in real time about what's going on. Um, and it's got a couple of different kinds of views. I mean, uh, the the neatest. Well, let's see. That's the signal, it's, signal itself. Um, we can look at the spectrum like that. And you'll, you'll sort of see my voice. And if I go, ooh, see this one spike sticking up. Um, if we go to uh, a sonogram, <clears throat> then you can get this kind of thing. So you can do that kind of stuff. And this is all just sitting there in squeak. Uh, it was kind of. Uh, <clears throat> It got started, I think, because uh, years ago I had done a fast Fourier transform program in Squeak just to see how short it would be. Because one of the things I cut my teeth on when I was at Stanford was really fast FFTs, um, <clears throat> and and they were big and messy. And uh, and you can do one in Squeak, you know, a uh, couple of five line methods. Um, so that was fun. And then uh, and then what happened was Andreas Rob joined our group. And uh, and he put in floating point arrays and really fast operations, and all of a sudden all that stuff just became real time, and that, so that's been a lot of fun. So you can play around with FFTs and signal processing. Um, then also John Maloney likes uh, sound, and he, so he he's put in a number of things. This is a little sound recorder. Boop. So we can stop, and uh, and you can make a tile from that sound. Uh, let me just play it here. Boop. Okay, works. Um, we can ask it to trim, which should should get rid of some of that noise Boop. on the beginning. So now we've got that, and now you can uh, you can show what you've got here, and you can actually uh, take this thing and sort of go looking through the waveform all the way through there. It's a, it's a long thing. Um, but you also can uh, play around. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> you can have all that fun. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, another little bit of music here is. Uh, this is a great assembly that Alan put together. Uh, with all sorts of things. This uh, <clears throat> this unit over here is a MIDI. Uh, control panel that John Maloney did, um, and then he and I worked together on this thing that displays the notes. So, for instance, this is a piece. So you can just move around here, play like that, um, and uh, and then these are controls that control, you know, gain and left-right volume on uh, on each of the voices in this piece. And then what Alan did was he he wrote uh, here's the controls 
These are tile scripts. So this, um, I'll just read through. This says, um, Trombear's range gets 650 minus Trombear's Y. So this is basically squeaked underneath there, but there are these little tiles that let you, let you program it. And the, in, the net result of all that he did was, um, when I take this player and pick it up as a graphic, if I move it left to right, it changes the balance on the clarinet if you look down there. And also, if I move it up and down, not only does he get bigger and smaller, Alan did that too, but it changes the gain on the clarinet, okay? So you can then start to play this whole thing. And I take the clarinet. While you're going, you can, uh, <coughs> you can, hello, oh, excuse me. You can, uh, you've got these uh, dynamic controls for the different instruments that are being played. Uh, so, and you can go, and right now that's editing the volume. You can change the, um, you can change the attack on this. Just change it into any line you want. Anyway, uh, so that's some of the music stuff that's in here. Uh, this particular content isn't, but you can you can build it all. Uh, whoops. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, I'll just uh, show you a little bit about graphics that uh, I don't know if I'll get into all the 3D and stuff, but this is, uh, <clears throat> um, here's a little Warplet demo. So Warplet lets you do just what Bitplet does, except you can also scale it and you can rotate it. And this is just a cute little demo that does that. So if I move the mouse up and down, it changes the scale. If I move it right and left, it changes uh, the rotation and it's looking at itself. So you get this kind of infinite effect. You do all sorts of fun designs for that. And then if you go below the center with the control, then you get it starts to do uh, propagate noise out from the inside. It's a lot of fun to do this with music. Um, and uh, something that Andreas added was beyond BitBlit, it's uh, <coughs> real anti-alias outline graphics. Um, so that's, this was taken from an outline font. And let me just get the old magnifier out so you can tell what's going on. If you look carefully, um, this was some text that's uh, showing through a mask that's doing a rotating pattern. But, but if you take a look at Andreas's outline font, you'll see that it's also translucent inside the characters. And uh, he did a really neat Thing based on that, he, he implemented the whole flash graphics standard in Squeak. Um, so we've got something showing here, which uh, if I just stop that. Um, this is a bitmap uh, image. And down here at the bottom is a little control that's printing out the uh, size of the bitmap. Uh, it's 41, 41K bytes right now. And if I make it bigger and bigger, uh, not only does it, it gets jaggy on the outside, and also you can see it's now up to 200K. Uh, that's because it's in 16, 16 bits. But if we grab this little character out of the picture, and bring him over here, um, I can get a little uh, thing that will... Show the compressed size of it. So that one's 1,400 bytes. 
and it stays 1400 bytes no matter how, you, how big you make it. So that's pretty nice to have around. <clears throat> and the last little quick thing I'll do is a little piece of 3D. This is the bunny. Now, um, Jeff Pierce uh, came to us from the Alice project at Carnegie Mellon and implemented a significant part of the Alice 3D system in Squeak. Um, so uh, this is a little script area, and you can make the bunny move forward. Um, it's got an undo. And uh, and let's see. I don't want to take too. I, I think I'll just jump to my favorite demo here, which is <coughs> you do that, and the bunny watches wherever the cursor goes. Anyway, there's uh, Andreas has done some really serious uh, stuff in 3D. Well, I'll just take you. Um, this is a little 3D world that Alan set up, uh, and you can navigate through it like that. And this all runs much, much faster with Andreas's new stuff, but I had a little bit of trouble getting the computer all working. Anyway, this is the group that I worked with in the did squeak, and that's probably a good place to stop. Liveliness is is crucial. I mean, and and you know, there there are people who are lively and people who are not too. Um, I don't know. Uh, there there is yeah no there is something you know. I mean, uh, you, you come to a university and you want to tell everybody to sort of go out and, and do cool stuff, but I don't know how you tell anybody to. It was, uh, I mean, I often think that we were just incredibly lucky to be around at the time when it was all starting and to be able to create it afresh. But at the same time, this, the fun I've been having of going back and doing Smalltalk 72 in Squeak, I mean, anybody can start from almost nothing and pretty soon be doing fun stuff. And, and you know, there ought to be a course in that. It's, it's like bootstrapping. But then, but you want to, the thing that was so wonderful working, that has been so wonderful throughout working with Alan, is that he's also always got his mind on the romantic space, you know, the, um, whether it's whether it's working with kids or doing music or doing graph, you know, cool stuff with graphics. And, um, and but I mean, I think you get that. It's just that you should, uh, if you're a nuts and bolts guy, you should hook up with somebody else who's who wants to do the other stuff too. I mean, it's it's the kind of thing that I think teens should be great at. Um, it'd be fun to do a, a bootstrapping course where, you know, you, you had sort of an artist and a technologist. I'm sure people have done this. But there is something of <clears throat> there's something about keeping it simple and keeping it lively, you know, immediate. And and I, I don't know how you teach that. I mean I think you just uh, some people want to do that. Yeah. 